Well, hey, Mountainside, it's Tuesday. It's December the 28th. Wow, the month is almost gone. But not only the month of December, but the year 2021 is almost behind us. It's kind of crazy how fast the years go by. Hey, I pray that everyone had a wonderful Christmas season. I know Vera and I were we're certainly blessed. Our daughter and son-in-law, two grandsons came from Phoenix, and then we all traveled together to Clovis to join our other son and daughter-in-law there and our other three grandsons, along with my mom and uh, one of my brothers and his wife on Christmas Eve. It was certainly a great time, but as always, it's just too short. There's never enough time. You know, that's one thing I look forward to in eternity. No concept of time and all of the constraints that come with it. Someday. Hey, Mary House came home over the weekend. We're certainly thankful for that. But I also got a note from John Beatty and his mom, our dear sister Kay. She is in the local hospital downtown. And I don't know the details, but keep her in your prayers. Also, John told me they finally scheduled his back surgery. And if you if you know John, uh, he has a severely debilitating back problems. So let's be praying for both of them and praying that those surgeons in February can correct whatever it is that needs corrected and he can get back to some semblance of, of normalcy. Uh, Sunday, uh, what a blessing it was to see all of you. Uh, we had a lot of old mountainsiders with us as well as having many of our own away. I guess it was a pretty decent temporary trade-off, but also want to thank Kelton Slyer. He uh, was able to come back and be with us. And, you know, he didn't just visit. We conned him into leading singing and what a blessing it was. Because of a different circumstance, I wasn't able to sit in on the cafe class this past Sunday. But I know the text that they were looking at and, and have some thoughts that I want to share. And the text happens to be Esther chapter 3. And I find it interesting how this chapter is so similar to our Sunday morning text, the things we talked about uh, this past Sunday and what we're going to continue to talk about in the next few weeks uh, in Matthew 7 from the Sermon on the Mount. And by the time you get to chapter 3 of the book of Esther, the king, Xerxes, he's elevated a particular noble named Haman to the highest of positions, probably second only to the king, I would assume, and it was customary for one to bow before a noble of this status. But there lies the heartburn in this story. It was customary to do so, but there was a particular Jewish exile in this country, and his name was Mordecai. He also had a younger cousin named Esther, whom he had raised because her parents had died. And Mordecai was a devout Jew, and he wasn't about to bow down to this Haman because Haman was simply a man, and Mordecai was going to bow only to God. And this went on for quite a while, and apparently Haman was unaware until some of his officials told him about the disobedience of this particular Jew. And finally, Haman sees it for himself. He sees this noncompliance, and as you can imagine, he is, oh, he is outraged. Now, Haman, in his position, he could have treated this as a capital offense. He could have taken Mordecai's life, and no one would have said anything about it. And uh, I think Mordecai no doubt knew this and knew he was taking that chance. But in Mordecai's eyes, only his God was worthy enough to bow before. But Haman, on the other hand, he had such a hatred for the Jews, he plotted to kill far more Jews than just Mordecai for this disobedience. He basically was plotting to destroy the nation. And he takes his plan before the king. And he isn't all that truthful in his horrible report concerning the Jewish people. But he is, however, convincing enough. And the king gives him the authority to do basically as he likes. And if you want to know the rest of the story, I'm going to challenge you to go read the book of Esther. It's a great book. I'm more interested this evening in the conviction of Mordecai. He was not about to disobey or dishonor his God, the God, our God. And this is what strikes my interest. You know, could I or would I have done the same? And I don't know. And I'm glad for, at least for now, that I'm not challenged by the world to have to do such a thing. But you know what? I, I could be someday. Sunday, I read a passage from, from Joshua. And you remember when Joshua gathered the Jewish people together, they're finally, after years and years of wandering and all that stuff that went on, they're about to enter the promised land. 
And Joshua flat tells him, he says, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And Jesus, you know, thousands of years later, he will challenge his followers and does so in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's challenging you and I basically to do the same. We have to choose. But he puts it like this. In this past Sunday's text, he said, take the narrow gate. You see, to bring this to a close, our Savior isn't impressed with thoughtless and heartless piety. And that's easy to do. It's easy to fool someone. Our God, our Savior, wants the real thing. He wants it all. He wants our hearts. Superficial religion, it might satisfy the casual observer, but Jesus, oh, he wants something far more. He demands obedience basically from the inside out. You know, saying whatever religious statement one wants to make without the sincerity of actual obedience, do you realize that makes it meaningless? You know, maybe we do fool the world around us, but we cannot fool God. It's impossible. And in our times, with people so confused, so upset, so uptight, uh, for obvious reasons, it's imperative. It is imperative that you and I be real with our faith from the inside out. And in the long run, you know what? The world is watching us. Our fellow believers are watching us. And Jesus says they will know us by our fruit. Our question is this, am I, are you bearing kingdom fruit or is, is my fruit of this world? So let's encourage one another to be huge harvesters of kingdom fruit, that which can make an eternal difference. I like the story of Esther, I like the story of Mordecai, because you know what? Just as we talked about this past Sunday, Mordecai went through the narrow gate. Mordecai was bearing kingdom fruit. And in the end, he made an eternal difference for a lot of folks, probably. Hey, thank you for tuning in. Uh, hope you have a blessed rest of the week and be safe out there.